everyone to the 2024 Grief Talks Conference. We are honored to have you here with us today with over 1,300 friends joining from around the world. We hope you've had a morning full of learning and making connections with one another. And if you're just joining us now, we welcome you with much excitement to join our inspiring afternoon keynote speaker, Linda Tai. We want to offer as much space as possible for Linda this afternoon, so we're going to communicate all conference logistics and housekeeping items directly in the chat. Feel free to use the chat yourself to share and exchange ideas with one another, or even to reflect and respond to things that maybe Linda is sharing with us. If you have specific questions for Linda, please use the Q&A feature so that we can find those easily and get them to her at the end. I am now honored to introduce Linda Tai, a trauma therapist who specializes in cutting edge brain and body-based modalities for the healing of complex developmental trauma. As an educator and consultant, she is gifted with the capacity to contextualize, synthesize, and communicate complex and nuanced issues pertaining to trauma, attachment, and the nervous system including the impact of oppressive systems upon identity, mental health, and well-being. Linda is passionate about breaking the cycle of historical and intergenerational trauma at the individual and community levels, and deeply believes in the healing power of coming together in community to grieve. Born in Vietnam, raised in Australia, and now living in Alaska, Linda is a former child refugee who is not only redefining what it means to be Vietnamese, to be Australian, and to be a United Statesian, she is redefining what it means to be wounded and whole and a healer. Welcome, Linda. Cảm ơn chị Lexi. Cảm ơn bạn. Tôi rất vui. Tôi rất vui có cơ hội hôm nay cùng các bạn. Tên tôi là Thái Kim Ngọc. Tên cha tôi là Thái Văn Nam, tên mẹ tôi là Dương Thúc Hà. Gia đình tôi đến từ vùng Sóc Trăng bên Việt Nam. Thank you, Sister Lexi, and thank you to all of my friends who are here in this space, for you are all my friends. It's such a gift to be here with you all today. You know, witnessing grief requires holding the fullness of someone's story so that you can hold the fullness of someone's loss. And yet losses can't be mourned until they can be named. And our stories can't be unpacked in its fullness until there is a compassionate witness. And so thank you for being compassionate witnesses for me and for each other. My family fled Vietnam when I was two, and it's taken me a lifetime to unpack and make sense of the impact of that upon myself and my family. And so this presentation will seek to cover this terrain of the ambiguous losses of adult children of refugees. See, we often think of trauma as something that happened that shouldn't have happened. And yet trauma is also something that didn't happen that should have happened. And in a similar way, we often frame grief as I had something and now it's gone. And grief is also I didn't get something. And the not getting of that experience has left a pervasive emptiness on my inner landscape. And so in essence, this presentation for you today will involve some research, but it's also, it's mostly me search, my own personal search for an origin story that would help me to make sense of my life, to heal myself and to heal my parents. You know, there's a tenderness that becomes forged when your soul becomes tempered by the tears that your ancestors were not able to weep. And so I dedicate this presentation to anyone who's ever been uprooted, displaced, homeless, unsheltered or unwanted and has sought refuge and sanctuary through migration, addiction or suicide. I'm going to pause and land here with you. So in 2019, families were being separated at the US-Mexico border and the sheer degree of vitriol being hurled by the then US president at people who were seeking safety 
by risking their lives and their children's lives to flee across borders impelled me to come forward with my story. The photo on the left is my refugee camp intake photo. It is the very first photo I have of myself. And the photo on the right is a photo from my website, Linda Tai, the somatic trauma therapist. And here's the reason why I share my story these days. And it's the words of Vietnamese American author Viet Thanh Nguyen. I was once a refugee, although no one would mistake me for being a refugee now. Because of this, I insist on being called a refugee since the temptation to pretend that I'm not a refugee is strong. It would be so much easier to call myself an immigrant, to pass myself off as belonging to a category of migratory humanity that is less controversial, less demanding and less threatening than a refugee. And I want you to also know that your condition is not your identity. My condition is not my identity. I no longer call people of the African-American diaspora slaves. You were enslaved. It was the process of abduction and enslavement. There was an institution that was built around enslavement. And in a similar way, I am a refugee. I was a refugee and my family sought refuge. And so throughout today's presentation, you'll hear me interchangeably use these phrases, refugee, someone who seeks refuge, a person who seeks refuge, someone who seeks sanctuary, as a reminder that we're talking about people. And so who seeks refuge? And so the United Nations Convention for Refugees has a definition and that definition says that you have to be outside of your nation of origin and due to a fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality or membership of a particular social group or political opinion, you have fled, you're outside your national borders and you're unwilling to avail yourself to the protection of your, your, your government. And at mid-2020, so this is before the, the war between Russia and Ukraine, and this is before the genocide in Gaza, as well as the other wars and conflicts that we have going on in the world these days that have emerged since mid-2020. The United Nations High Commission for Refugees estimates that over 80 million people were forcibly displaced worldwide as a result of persecution, conflict, violence, or human rights violations. I'll take a breath with you with this next piece. 40 to 50% of those who seek refuge are children because we don't leave our children behind. And I know that while the desire is to hyper-focus in on current situations, I'm going to offer this presentation to you from the vantage point of a former child refugee from the vantage point of someone who is the adult child of refugees, who's now 47 years old and has, has the ability to articulate what happened to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see, what happens when we get to somewhere new is life is hard and we're expected to be happy and be grateful and get on with our lives and put the past behind us. And yet there's an aftermath of this. There's an aftermath to, to needing to learn to forget. And I've spent most of my adult life like as if I'm walking backwards through a, through a snowy landscape and I'm erasing my footsteps as soon as they appear so that I'm learning to not remember so that there will be nothing to forget. And then as an adult, because I've lived my life learning to forget and hoping that no one will actually ask in detail, where are you from? Beyond where are you from? 
that I can be washed away with the times and tides of, you know, migration, immigration. This is something that needs to be named so that I can heal, so that those of us who may have had forced migration in our lineage can heal, so that you as mental health providers, when your clients say to you, oh, yeah, dad was from Hungary and mum was from Poland, that you actually pause and you ask about the nature of the departure from Poland or Hungary and the circumstances around that and can interweave this knowledge into the intergenerational impact that this has had on the person who is in front of you who may not be aware of it. And there's another piece to this. This man is Harold Napoleon, and he's an Alaska native from the remote west coast of Alaska, and he's one of the first Alaska natives to go to college where he studied history, and he continues on to serve his village at the village council level, at the state tribal levels of government and self-governance, and along the way he develops a problematic, oh, problematic relationship with alcohol. And in a blackout drunk, he kills his four-year-old son, ends up in Fairbanks Correctional Facility. And during his time there, he thinks about his life and the history of his people. He writes a magnificent book called Uyurak, The Way of the Human Being, which is artful storytelling, narrative reconstruction and historical fact in such a plain and direct way that it clearly demonstrates the, the, the relationship between historical trauma, colonisation, genocide, intergenerational trauma and addiction and domestic violence. And somewhere about eight years ago, I, I hear an interview with Harold about alcoholism and domestic violence in certain Native communities. And in it, he says, there are Alaska Native women and children fleeing certain villages in rural Alaska like refugees, like refugees. And in that moment, my heart exploded because the definition of a refugee expanded conceptually. It's anyone whose current safety issues leads them to fear for their future. Home ceases to exist long before someone leaves home. And they embark into the unknown seeking refuge, the riskiness, and the treacherousness of the unknown. And there's often systemic violence and oppression due to a marginalised identity. And so if we lateralise this definition, this then includes two-spirit LGBTQIA plus youth who may be living in families or cultures or parts of the world where their fundamental identity is being violated. This includes those who are leaving an oppressive or abusive or addicted family system embedded within a closed community. This also includes folks who are religious refugees. And with this expansion of this definition of refugee, I then I imploded on the inside because all of a sudden there were more people like me out there who experienced a phrase that's used in, uh, in psychoanalysis, actually, as psychological homelessness. We don't know who we are or where we come from and the conditions that give rise to the sense of sanctuary long cease to exist before we fled. And it's taking us perhaps the work of a lifetime to regain a felt sense of safety. And so I invite you to hold all of that in mind as we transition towards the four stages of seeking refuge, which applies to so many of us. So there's the pre-flight conditions, the flight conditions, resettlement and secondary migration. So pre-flight is where home ceases to be a sanctuary. It's the, you know, how many... How many of your neighbours would need to disappear or be violated for you to actually then consider leaving everyone and everything you have ever known? What are the circumstances that would cause for your home, your homeland, 
to become so unlivable that you would even contemplate packing up your bags and leaving. Flight is the exodus itself. It's risking danger in order to get out. And this is where individuals, whether fleeing a war zone or abusive homes, which are also war zones, are most vulnerable to human traffickers because drugs you can only sell once, humans you can sell over and over and over and over again. Resettlement is where we make it to somewhere safe and we start a new life. And secondary migration is where we find supportive community. Perhaps we relocate and we can forge a new life together and actually perhaps begin to heal or perhaps begin to set up the circumstances and conditions within which the next generation may possibly heal. So in service of expanding awareness around the pre-flight conditions that cause for individuals and families to seek refuge, I'm going to showcase a poem by Warshan Shire, who is a London-based Kenyan-born Somali writer, poet, editor, and teacher. And this poem reveals the emotional side of the refugee crisis. And so the intended audience is anyone who may not understand why people seek refuge or seek asylum. Home. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. Your neighbors running faster than you, breath bloody in their throats. And the boy you went to school with who kissed you dizzy behind the old tin factories, holding a gun bigger than his body. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. No one leaves home unless home chases you, fire under feet, hot blood in your belly. And even then, you carry the anthem under your breath, only tearing up your passport in airport toilets, sobbing as each mouthful of paper made it clear that you would not be going back. You have to understand, and no one would put their children in a boat unless the sea is safer than the land. No one burns their palms under trains, beneath carriages. No one spends days and nights in the gallbladder of a truck feeding on newspaper unless the miles traveled mean something more than journey. No one crawls under fences, wants to be beaten, wants to be pitied. No one chooses refugee camps or strip searches where your body is left aching or prison because prison is safer than a city of fire and one prison guard in the night is safer than 14 men who look like your father. No one could take it, could stomach it. No one's skin would be tough enough. The go-home blacks, refugees, dirty immigrants, asylum seekers, sucking our country dry, niggers with their hands out. They smell strange, savage, messed up their own country, and now they want to mess up ours? How do the words, dirty looks, roll off your back? And maybe it's because the blow is softer than a limb torn off. Or the words are more tender than 14 men between your legs. Or the insults are easier to swallow than rubble, than bone, than your child's body in pieces. I want to go home. But home is the mouth of a shark. Home is the barrel of a gun. And no one would leave home unless home chased you to the shore. Unless home told you to quicken your legs. Leave your clothes behind. Crawl through the desert. Wade through the oceans. Drown. Save. Be hungry. Beg. Forget pride. Your survival is more important. No one leaves home unless home is a sweaty voice in your ear saying, leave. Run away from me now. I don't know what I've become, but I know that anywhere is safer than here. I'm going to pause this here and invite you to place your hand or your hands on the areas of your body that may appreciate some contact or perhaps some pressure, perhaps some gentle rocking, perhaps looking towards your exits and the route between you and your exits, perhaps looking at the window or the imaginary window and looking to the horizons. <laughs> 
perhaps you may wish to have a look behind you to check that there's nobody chasing you. Twist and have a look behind in the other direction. Notice the space around you, the objects in your space as well as the space in your space. Notice the space above you, perhaps rolling your shoulders open, perhaps not. And notice the space directly underneath you. Scrunch your face, release your jaw, make a sound, any sound, a soundless sound. Perhaps scrunch your fingers and your toes, scrunch your body, release. You know, I once heard a poet say that a refugee is somebody that nobody wants. And I know that trauma is unspeakable. And I also know, given the ways of displacement that have occurred over the last mill millennia of human history, that someone in your ancestry has lived through the unspeakable in order for you to be where you are now. And no survivor guilt around that. And perhaps that someone might be you. Mm -hmm. Or your direct parents. Or your grandparents. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to share with you now a simple story of my family's journey of seeking refuge. And it's a story that I've heard my entire life. And so I'm going to offer you options. You can look away from the screen. You can look towards the screen and away. There will be images. And when we get to the part about the storm, there'll be no more potentially triggering images, I hope, while holding space that for each of us, what is a lot will be different. So without going into the back history of colonialism, the politics of war, there was a war in Vietnam between the communists of North Vietnam and the US-based South Vietnam from 1955 to 1975. And there was much loss and suffering for everyone involved. And when the US troops pulled out in 1973, it was only a matter of time until the communists were able to declare victory on April 30 of 1975. And the evacuations began. However, the exodus began long before the fall of Saigon, as the communists swept southbound through Vietnam. And whenever I asked my dad about the communists and why our people wanted to leave, he'd just shake his head and just say that they were bad people and that everyone wanted to leave. And it was only years later as, as a college student that I learned that with communist victory came the terror of free education camps, executions, disappearances of family members and forced asset redistribution. And since 1975, close to 2 million Vietnamese individuals have received refuge all over the world. Against the backdrop of this, in July of 1976, 15 months after communist victory, in a little village in the far south of Vietnam, Sop Trung, my father walks with his kinsfolk to my mother's house and they get married. And it's a, an arranged marriage, as is the custom of my people. He's 24 and she's 16. My mother went to live with her in-laws, as is the custom of my people. And I was born in February of 1977. And dad is in and out of hiding for the first two years of my life because he's wanted by the communists. He was the manager for his aunt's gas station, which made him in cahoots with a capitalist. 
And one day in March of 1979, shortly after my second birthday, my dad turns up and says to my mother, we're leaving. My aunt, the capitalist gas station owner, had had her fortune read and she tried to leave Vietnam twice already, unsuccessfully. And the fortune teller said that she needed to ensure safety for two of her nephews and their families. And there was so much family disagreement about this because I was two at the time and I'm the firstborn child of a firstborn child. My mother was six months pregnant at the time and perhaps dad could go first and then send for us once we'd made it to safety. However, that would leave mum and I alone, marked with a capitalist father who had fled. And we could clearly see from the way the children of South Vietnamese um, military members were treated, that there was no future for us if we were left behind. And so my father, my pregnant mother and my two-year-old self leave in the middle of the night without telling anyone, not even my grandparents. And we make it to a harbour town and live in a house with 40 other refuge seekers for a month while the boat is being made under cover of night and while gasoline to fuel the boat motor is being stashed one cup at a time over the course of many years. And we're bringing all of those supplies together to be able to make this journey. And in April of 1979, nearly four years after communist victory, we left in the middle of the night with 140 others on a boat similar to these ones, made by people who only knew how to make boats suitable for river travel, with engines only suitable for river travel. And the boats were overcrowded because we don't leave our people behind. An open ocean was treacherous and we were out at open ocean for a few days on our particular boat when our boat was quickly outrun by pirates who had boats and motors suitable for open ocean. And they pillaged and they plundered and disabled our boat motors and destroyed all the lights except for one. And so we floated out in open ocean carried by the currents and our prayers. And after a few days, we hit a storm. And in amidst this storm, we see a light. And it was a floodlight offered by Maisons Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, by their ship. And they'd seen our one little light and they were floodlighting the land and the ocean and showing the way to safe harbour to dock our little boat, but they didn't know that our boat had no motors to power the way. And yet the storm surge that had been pushing our boat towards land pushes our little boat towards this harbour. And we hit a sandbar. And our boat starts seesawing in the ocean, being torn apart and sinking. And my mother sits me, my two-year-old self, onto my dad's shoulders and ties me on with his shirt and he swims with me. He swings with me into the blackness of the stormy seas towards the idea of the possibility of land. And some folks were already in the water with life buoys calling out to my mother, who's now seven months pregnant. They're saying to her, Nyayde, Nyayde go oi, Nyayde. And so my mother, standing on top of this seesawing boat, grabs her seven-month pregnant belly and holds her breath and jumps. Once on land, my parents found each other and my dad buried my mother and I up up to our necks in sand that night to keep us warm and the next day, some of the young men swam out to the boat to salvage whatever they could and we started walking. If you like, you can just move one leg and the other leg, just some bilateral movement. So they start walking and locals are pointing the way. And so we kept moving in the direction that they were pointing in because that was the only option that we had. We were on Bidong Island off of the coast of Malaysia. And we made it to a refugee camp established by the United Nations High Commission for Refugees and the International Red Cross. 
where the prevailing currents carried fortunate refuge seekers who'd made it thus far in their search for sanctuary. It's estimated that between 500,000 and 800,000 Vietnamese boat people didn't make it across the South China Sea. We lived in this refugee camp for six months. Six months. I know that six months can sound like an eternity, and I want to offer some context in terms of current day situation. In the United States, because of the decimation of the systems that help people to seek refuge, outside of those who are seeking refuge from Ukraine and from Afghanistan, the current average amount of time that it takes someone to have their application be processed successfully is 17 years. 17 years. We were fortunate. We lived in a refugee camp for six months. My little sister is born and two months later, when my mother gave birth, she was 97 pounds. And shortly before my sister's birth, my dad's adding, out cutting firewood, a tree falls on his head, it fractures his skull, he's incoherent. And so an interpreter or a Doctors Without Borders medic communicates to my mother that my father, father was surely going to die and maybe perhaps she could give them permission to operate on him and maybe perhaps they would be able to save his life, maybe perhaps. But surely doing nothing equals death. And so during those soul-wrenchingly tough periods of my life, I reflect on my mother at this point in time. She's 20 years old, she's got a two and a half year old and a newborn and she's living in a refugee camp with a good man to whom she's had an arranged marriage. And she keeps moving forward because that's the only option that she has. And so my dad gets operated on, fragments of his skull bone get removed. And yet to this day, my dad still has a soft spot on his skull where a small impact could cause a significant brain injury and death. And he's never told anyone in the 40 years that he's lived in Australia. And he knows now that he won't get deported. But those first 10 years, he was just so terrified of getting any sort of medical attention for this because he was so worried that if people found out, he'd be sent back to Vietnam. So during dad's recovery, we get interviewed by Australian immigration officials who were living in the refugee camp processing refugee applications. And my mother was so worried about the interview because of dad's recent surgery, his head was wrapped up like Frankenstein. And the story goes is that my little sister was just so cute that the two Australian immigration officials played with her and then stamped our paperwork. We were going to Australia. And we were sponsored out to Australia under a pilot rural resettlement scheme that was organised through the Catholic Church. And Tumut was a very small town, it still is, 7,000 individuals and no traffic lights. And the Catholic Church and the Anglican Church communities collaborated to resettle four Vietnamese families into this strange new land where people would work to water the grass and fertilise the grass and cut the grass down, but you couldn't eat the grass. And they didn't seem to use this grass for anything. They didn't feed livestock with it. They didn't use it for arts or crafts or building anything with it, and they didn't eat it. It was such a strange place. And yet there were so many kind and loving people who helped us. They helped my father and the other fathers get jobs at the local lumber mill. My mother went to the local technical college and learned how to sew. And we saved money and got a place to live and began thinking about the future. And even though my parents won't talk about it, interpersonal racism is one of the reasons why we chose to leave this rural town. And the other reasons are more opportunity for work, for education, for their children, and to find community, other Vietnamese people. And so it's with sad hearts that we bid farewell to some of the kindest people that we ever knew. People who helped us return 
to a sense of normalcy. And we embarked on a 325 mile road trip in an orange sunny Datsun with a road map and marginal English towards traffic lights and community. And I lived in Melbourne from the age of five onwards. And even though I don't have any memories under the age of 10, I do remember our little flat in Carnegie and mum and dad would leave at seven in the morning and I was entrusted with washing my sister and dressing us both and feeding us breakfast with food that mum and dad had left in the sink and then putting the dirty dishes in the sink, locking up the apartment, walking my little sister to kindergarten en route to elementary school for myself. And yet there are key distinctions between refugees and immigrants when it comes to cultural adjustment strategies. You see, immigration is voluntary. Refugees are forcibly displaced. Home ceased to exist long before we left. And there is no home to go back to. And yet immigrants still face similar issues around cultural adjustment, perhaps racialized identity issues. And these folks can include international students, migrant workers, uh, satellite babies and immigrants whose races and ethnicities do not match the dom dominant host culture, country's race and ethnicity and religion. And the other piece about the distinction between refugees and immigrants is that refugees arrive before immigrants of any particular uh, national or ethnic group. And I'll say that again, refugees arrive before immigrants. As a result of this, community resources required for enculturation do not exist or may not exist for refugees. They may exist for later waves of refugees, but certainly not for the first wave of any diaspora, as was the case with my family. And there are also many individual, family, community and societal factors, pressures, and resources that can contribute towards acculturation and enculturation. So acculturation are changes that occur when you encounter and adapt to a new country, a new culture. We're learning language, we're learning customs, we're learning how loud to speak, how much distance to have between us and the other people, what the dynamics of hierarchy are. Enculturation is the process of retaining your own native culture and customs. And growing up as a child in Australia, I thought that these existed on a linear matrix, like on unidimensional constructs, that being more Australian being, means being less Vietnamese. But it actually exists as a matrix. And as mental health clinicians and individuals with lived experiences, it's important to be curious about the why behind the adoption and rejection of host, host culture and native culture and the forces behind adoption and rejection by host culture and by native culture. Yeah. Knowing that this can change over time and across various domains of life. I'll offer a few stories just to illustrate. You know, for our family, those first two years of life in rural Australia, one of four newly arrived Vietnamese families, acculturation was a survival imperative. Really well-meaning English, English language teachers advised my parents to give my sister and I anglicised names because it would make our lives better if Anglo-Australians could pronounce our names. They were right, and it's still a loss that I have only recognised in recent years. By the time we left Tumut, I was perfectly fluent in English and I'd quickly lost the three other languages that I knew prior. And due to the pressures of life in a new country, my parents forged ahead with what was available to them. My mother had had a ninth grade education. My dad had a third grade education. In the 1980s in Australia, the labour unions were strong. So mum would work afternoon shift. Oh, sorry, mum would work morning shift and dad would work afternoon shift. And so I knew they loved us because they were never there and I never saw them there together. And so I barely got to hear them speaking Vietnamese with each other. And they'd speak to us in Vietnamese that we were capable of understanding, which wasn't very much by that point in time. 
And so into this void steps kindergarten and elementary school. And it wasn't long before my sister and I spoke solely in English to each other. And so by the time there were Vietnamese language schools available, I'm eight and my sister's six. And we are best friends on Sunday afternoons for three years because we couldn't make friends with the other Vietnamese kids. And I remember our Vietnamese language teachers just looking at my sister and I and just shaking their heads at us. And that was where within culture rejection then began. And running parallel to this, I'm at school and I want to make friends and I quickly learned to to memorise the names of all the Australian rules football teams and where they are on the AFL ladder and the names of the most popular players and what happens blow by blow in every single quarter of every single game that happened that weekend so that I could make friends. And so as I got older, my Vietnamese never got beyond rudimentary Vietnamese and my parents' English never progressed beyond transactional language. And I became marginalised, not belonging anywhere. And so in my teens, I appeared before the juvenile justice court on charges of shoplifting and vandalism. I was expelled from the fancy private girls' school that my parents, who were working in factories, had saved up for me to go to. And yet, as an adult, I still sought to find the origin story that would helped me to make sense of my life. And as a college student, I studied modern Vietnamese history and modern Chinese history and Vietnamese language and Mandarin Chinese. And I had professors, both Anglo-Saxon and Vietnamese and Chinese, who knew why I didn't know and knew why I wanted to know and didn't need to ask me why I didn't know and why I wanted to know. And so part of my own journey of healing has been grief and reclamation of cultural identity. This is a photo of New York City, 9-11. Everyone's going in different directions and yet they're all going home because trauma ignites a homing instinct for physical home, emotional comfort and psychological safety. And when COVID-19 hit, the Australian Embassy in LA made the announcement to all Australian citizens in North America that commercial flights flights are going to dwindle and if you want to go home, go home now, but if you don't have to go home, stay put. And my body had this uncontrollable, eviscerating response and I cried for three days and as a trauma therapist living in Alaska with a safe life and my parents in Australia in a safe life, I knew that my body was having a trauma response because that primal homing instinct that was not able to be fulfilled was sending my entire body into a trauma response. Yeah. And then eventually the tears landed with a melancholic thud. There's no going home. And what helped me stop crying was tapping into my parents' story, what little I knew of it at that point in time, and tapping into refugee resilience. Too often we talk about intergenerational trauma. In that moment, I oriented to refugee resilience. And so part of the bittersweetness of this pandemic is that I got to have an experience that connects me to my parents and traumatic homesickness would never have been on my radar. And I actually called my parents and talked about all of this and was able to get some more stories and to recognise the ways in which my parents weren't able to tell the stories of our ancestors or sing the songs of our people or talk about family members back home because the mere thought of it would cause for their bodies to have a trauma response. And so to protect themselves, inadvertently, I learned, because they couldn't talk about us, I learned and I made that mean that there was a fundamental sense of something wrong about us as a people. And yet they'd have that auto-hypnoid storytelling where they'd tell the same story over and over again in a loop. But if I asked questions into those stories, I'd get shut down. (laughs) 
And yet more pieces of the story came back home to me. And it caused me to reflect upon these little parts of my story and to recognise that you cannot grieve when you're in survival mode. And it's with such bittersweetness that I name December of 2014, when after 35 years in Australia, when my family was not living in survival mode because they paid off the house and their two children were grown and I wasn't so much of a mess, um, that we were able to be together and in that togetherness, the Syrian boat people crisis happened where thousands upon thousands were fleeing by boat in search of a, a better future. And the images of this were all over the Vietnamese language newspapers in Australia. And I happened to be home visiting my parents. And from what I could gather, there was a wave of post-traumatic memories revisiting the Vietnamese community through the reporting of the Syrian experience. Right? That was us, torn between homeland and the horrors of war. And when it's happening to you, when you are the news, when the trauma becomes chronic and ongoing, you stuff down your feelings because that's all you have. And grieving is not a possibility. And as I listened, I realised that so many people, including my parents and their community, were experiencing post-traumatic grief. And it was such a bittersweet gift from the Syrian boat people to the Vietnamese boat people because we were safe now and you are not. And on our boat, there was another couple with a child the same age as me. And in amongst that sinking chaos, actually, I'll backtrack a bit, in amongst the retelling of the story that emerged during the Syrian boat people crisis, I learned because my parents finally decided to tell me about the pillage and the plunder and the looping the looting and the mass traumatisation that happened as a result of the pirates that were taking women from our boat onto their boat. And I saw my mother's body heave with grief as that frozen terror was finally able to be moved out of her body. And my parents also got to share with me that there was another couple on the boat with a child the same age as mine whose father swam with this boy, side stroke to shore, and this child didn't make it to shore, similar to Alan Curdy. The terror over the price of freedom and the grief over the price of freedom is something that we don't ever get to talk about and unpack because we need to be grateful that people finally wanted us and embraced us and accepted us. And we are grateful and we also need a space for our grief. In August of 2021, the fall of Afghanistan happened and it very much mirrored what happened in Vietnam. And because of coming together through the Syrian boat people and the, the apart and togetherness because of the pandemic, I was able to orient towards my parents and they were able to orient towards us and each other and to talk about the ways in which what was happening in Afghanistan was causing for all of our nervous systems to unravel with anticipatory PTSD and anticipatory grief for that which is has yet to come. After the fall of Vietnam, there was a 20-year refugee crisis that then ensued and I felt like I was watching history unfolding again. And then in early 2022, at the age of 45, I read a blog that featured a snippet from a PBS documentary about the fall of Saigon. And for the first time, I felt it in my body what it means to lose one's country. 
And the video featured a South Vietnamese man who during the rapid southbound sweep of the, the, the communist forces made it onto one of these South Vietnamese naval vessels that was stationed off of the coast of Vietnam. And these gargantuan naval vessels were burgeoning with as many Vietnamese refuge seekers as possible because they knew that the end was coming. A few days later, the South Vietnamese president declared surrender and it was announced across the loudspeaker on this boat and well over 10,000 Vietnamese fell silent because it was over. The war was over. And shortly after that, this vessel en route to Guam had to go through Filipino waters to restock and refuel and in accordance with international maritime law. Because South Vietnam no longer existed as a sovereign nation, the South Vietnamese flag needed to be lowered. And the silence broke into solemnity as the entire boat sang together the South Vietnamese national anthem as an act of collective grief. Can you imagine seeing the flag of your own country being lowered because your country no longer exists? and singing your national anthem together as an act of collective grief and mourning. You lost a war. We lost a country. And so 43 years later, I finally understood. And so for those of us who've experienced open warfare and fleeing for our lives, any war may ignite body echoes of a familiar terror that lurks beneath the surface, hidden by ordinary, everyday life. And for most of my life, I turned away. And today, I can orient towards what is happening in the world. And I can orient towards it in such a way that I can name that what is happening in Gaza is igniting body echoes of cratered landscapes across my motherland, my mother's land. My mother's hands that hold the injustices of $100,000 bombs dropped out of war planes that cost $100 million onto people who earn less than a dollar a day. And as a child, my dad would say, at least we're not getting bombs dropped on us anymore in response to my childhood protests of carrying a heavy school bag or of taking care of my little sister when I wanted to play instead. And I never understood his strange gratitude for the absence of life threat, distorted by experiences unspoken that seek life, like tender tendrils of jungle vines despite Agent Orange. And it's strange to feel a kinship on the other side of the world with people because of bombs. And bittersweet, because we are safe now, and you are not. And we could at least try to run for our lives. I'm just going to pause there and land us all in what can feel like an absolute immensity yeah. and land us all together because my people survive what we survive because we made it through together and collective trauma requires collective grief and places for collective healing. And so wherever you are in this messy journey of looking for love in all the wrong places, of tapping into ancestral strength and resilience when it feels like there may not be any. I offer to you the strength and the tenderness of my people and of the diasporas that have come before me as a way of extending hope and hopefulness in the face of what can feel 
so incredibly overwhelming. If you like, I invite you to squeeze and release and to be gaps begin to take up some space and to know that unpacking the impacts of war can take a lifetime mm-hmm. and we need to talk about war we need to talk about war I'm going to invite Lexi back on to reorient us towards what happens next. I am absolutely going to echo what I think you are hopefully seeing in the chat, Linda, just how powerful the last hour has been with you. Um, And I'm seeing lots of um, just thanks and appreciation for you sharing your story, your lived experience and expertise um, and I think just how honored we all have been to um, to be um, in your presence and to to hear that directly from you today. Let me see. I think there's one maybe. Okay, there's one question in the chat that we'll go ahead and and answer before we wrap up our time here today. Sophia is asking, how do you stay grounded and motivated with such overwhelming pain and injustice? How do you navigate guilt? I name it as survivor guilt for myself within my own circumstances. And maybe there might be elements of of survivor guilt in your own ancestry that's actually knocking at the door that the external experiences are also tapping into and tapping against. And maybe that could allow for some sort of ancestral healing that may open up nervous system capacity to be able to continue to be in action around what's happening in the world today. And I just want to also make another point. I know I said war a lot, and what is happening in Gaza is not a war, it's a genocide, because war is what happens between two countries that are sovereign nations that that, that have their own standing military. Yeah. Yeah. And it takes a lot of nervous system activation to be able to name things. Mm. Yeah, and to have spaces where you can allow your nervous system to discharge nervous system activation that builds up. It can be discharged as grief. It can be discharged as sacred outrage. And yet we need to discharge it. Otherwise, it becomes lateral violence and we start hurting the people closest to us as well as other folks who are in activist groups with not good enough, not fast enough, Yeah, and the urgency with which our nervous system is experiencing that need to do something about this now. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. How about just one more question? Um, Dinah is asking, what advice would you give to college educators about how to best support refugees pursuing higher education? Sometimes it's enough to know and to not say. Yeah, because what you're offering is a witnessing and the creation of space so that someone can forge ahead and create a life that eventually that felt sense of safety can land and the normalcy and the kindness that you extend so that someone can be can can forge that sense of safety. And as educators, to be aware that for many of us, we like I did not pay attention to the Rohingya boat people, to the genocide in Congo, to anything that happened between 1979 and the Syrian boat people crisis in 2014, because I didn't have the capacity. Yeah. And to know that that that's okay too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I hope you're seeing in the chat just all the, there's so many 
thank yous and just grateful and I think just um, feeling really privileged to have been in your presence today with your kind of soothing voice and the way you were able to bring us all into this conversation. So we can't truly can't thank you enough for for sharing um, that that piece of yourself with us today. Um, for all of you um, still on with us, um, Linda has graciously um, offered if you'd like to navigate to um, her website, I can put that in the chat. There is a way to contact her there if you have um, questions that we weren't able to get to today or just things, of course, that stir are stirred up in you after this conversation that you want to um, maybe get her insight about. Um, you're able to do that um, on her website. Um, and we will, with that, we thank you so much. Um, we have an afternoon um, full of um, other um, just inspiring workshops. And so we'd um, invite you all to navigate back to the Zoom conference lobby. You can select your afternoon workshops there. And just in for you, Linda, for everyone on with us today, we just thank you all for setting aside the time today to lean into these important topics. Um, together, we can really create that space for all experiences of grief and loss. And I think we're um, just really in a space today where we're collectively, um, I hope, learning, learning together and um, just growing together as a community. Linda, thank you so much. We so appreciate you. Thank you, everyone.